Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 29 of the Gaming Rules podcast, where I talk about the games that I've been playing and interview somebody famous. And I've also got the results of the two competitions from last episode. Now, for those who listened last time, you'll know that I experimented with a co-host for the What Did I Play section. And the feedback that I got was generally really positive. A lot of people had some very constructive comments to make, specifically that they needed to hear more input from the other person. So I'm, I'm still experimenting with this and trying different things. But yes, I've got another co-host for this time. I'm also going to continue with these podcasts on YouTube. And even though it does take me more time to do, which is taking me away from paid work, I, I think it's, it's still worth it. I enjoy editing them to put them up on YouTube. And there are a number of people who got back to me and said that they have found my podcast because of YouTube. So they're already subscribers to the Gaming Rules videos and they, they came across the podcast because of that. So I will be continuing to do them on YouTube. Thanks as always to the sponsors of the show, GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. I just wanted to say a quick note before we start. I've just finished editing this podcast together and it's come out at over 45 minutes long. Now, initially, my podcasts were trying to do something different and that was to give you short podcasts in sort of 20, 25 minutes. But with the new format of the What I've Played This Week and having a co-host and the interview with Vittel, it has gone on a bit longer, so just a word of warning, if you're planning on listening to this on your, you know, daily jog or journey to work, then you might have to take the long way around. What Paul has played. So following on from last week, where I experimented with the co-host, I'm doing the same this week. And I'm happy to say that I'm joined by Brandon Kempf, who is the host of another podcast, which is the What Did You Play This Week podcast thing. Welcome to the show, Brandon. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. It's a pleasure. So before we start, just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and the podcast that you do. Um, well, I am Brandon Kempf. Like Paul said, I live in uh, basically the middle of the United States. Nothing but land all around me. Not enough gamers, but, but you know. I live here with my two daughters and my lovely wife, and we've been gaming together for, eh, kind of made it a family thing for the past five years or so. The podcast kind of started just coming out from all of that. I just wanted to be... I, I wanted something a little more to do with gaming as well. And also it was just the fact that I got a little lazy and instead of writing out everything that I'd been playing, I decided to record it and, and post everything that way. Yeah, you say lazy, but the amount of time it takes to, you know, put together and write and edit a podcast is, is far more than it would be if you just did write everything down. <laughs> it absolutely is, as I soon yeah. quickly found out. <laughs> <laughs> so now we've been doing the show, the What Did You Play This Week podcast thing for about a, a little over a year now, and we just keep on growing. Yeah, I mean, it started off, you know, when you started it, it was just you. But now you've got Patrick Hillier, who appears on most episodes as a guest spot. You've got uh, Derek Davis and Eric Booth as well. I got three fantastic uh, guys to join in. I don't know how I got that lucky, but they, they're they giving me some fantastic, giving everybody some fantastic content. Cool. So on with the games. I'm not going to cover everything that I've played because it's, it's quite a few, but just the highlights. Um, games Night at the Club started off with another learning game of Race Formula 90. Now I say learning game because I have played this a couple of times before, but it was so long ago and it's a fairly complex meaty game with lots of rules and lots of exceptions and there was going to be some new players in the game. So we ended up playing the, the short version of the basic game. Game's good, but it can run quite long. I mean, we were two and a half hours in, even though it was just the short sort of basic game. And there are a lot of rules, as I say, that are a bit fiddly and some exceptions. It's a game I want to play more in order to just become comfortable with it that I can then start enjoying it without, you know, having to keep looking things up and people questioning, is that right? And, uh, and start using the advanced rules because they include like, you know, weather and soft tires and things like that. But right now I'm at a stage where I'm thinking, is it actually worth the effort? Because I've got so many other games that I really enjoy playing. Is it worth putting in that effort in order to get comfortable with this one? I don't know. Do you do you have many other game many games in your collection where you feel the same? I have a I have a handful of games. It's mainly on one shelf, and they're all my GMT games, the ones that are all nice and in depth rules wise. Yeah, I love to learn them, and then it, they just never come out. So then it becomes that effort of keeping and remembering and learning them. But yeah, I have games like that, yes, Paul. Yeah, so I mean, 
I mean, I, I saw this game being played at a UK convention and I'm a Formula One fan. It's the only sport I, I follow and watch. But all racing games for me just ended up falling flat because they tended to be fairly random with dice rolling. And when I saw this one being played, it, re it looked really meaty. There was a lot of components, there was a lot going on. And I thought, ah, maybe this is the racing game that I've been looking for. So I did some research and, and, and I thought it was worth picking up. But as I say, I'm not sure about it now. Now, I know you've played Thunder Rally, which yes. is a racing game. And that's, yep. gr that's great. Everybody says that's great. It is. I, I, I really like Thunder Rally. I, I'm a fan of race games in general, from the real light dice chucking Formula D kind of stuff, all the way up to, to right now, I guess the medius one I have is Thunder Rally. Okay. I, I have not tried uh, Race Formula 90. It's been on a short list of things to try. I know a guy in our game group has it. He's just never bothered to bring it along to play right. it. So, <laughs> but yeah, I I really enjoy race games and Thunder Alley is a fantastic one. It, it brings into aspects and Thunder Alley, you know, leans more to that American style NASCAR yeah. stock car kind of racing, but it, it leans into more teamwork where you're using your cars as a team. You don't necessarily want to win, right? Or, you, or winning may not be the being finishing in first may not be the most important thing that you do the entire race. Okay. And okay. it's a, it's really neat in that aspect. Yeah, and the people who made Thunder Rally, they're doing a Formula One version of it, I believe, yep. Grand Prix. Grand Prix and uh, GMT, or if I know how to read GMT's emails well enough, that sh we should see that this summer, I think. Okay, so I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll look into that. I've not played Thunder Rally myself, but as I say, heard lots of good things about it. I'll have a look at this Grand Prix game, and that might end up replacing yep. race for me. We'll, we'll see. Fantastic. Interesting situation that happened in our game, which I I spoke about on my BGG Guild, uh, which is BGG Guild 2258 for those people who want to contribute. And it started a great discussion. What we had, and it was interesting because at the start of the night, before all the games got played, we ended up with a discussion about um, social etiquette at the gaming table and the unwritten rules, not rules of games, but the rules of sort of conduct and gameplay that you all take part in. And this was following on from me listening to the Perfect Information podcast. Yeah. And they were talking about that kind of thing. So we had all this discussion about, you know, when you sit down and you play a game, you enter into this unwritten contract that you're all there to play the game and finish the game. And if somebody gets up after an hour and says, I'm not enjoying this more anymore, I'm going to leave. Well, you just, you just don't do that. So yeah. we had this big discussion about what things are allowed and what things aren't allowed. And then during our game, we had one player who is known for sort of trolling a lot during games and doing crazy things. And I've personally avoided playing games with him now for, for a couple of years. Even though he's a friend, I, I kind of, I don't really like that sort of thing in games. If you're going to do it and you're going to mess around and it only affects you, do whatever you want. I, I don't really want somebody at the table who is directly trying to literally just mess the game up for everybody. Sometimes it can, it can be interesting and provide a twist, but other times it, it can be a, a bit wrong. Anyway, so in this game, he did something crazy on turn one, came up with some crazy idea that none of the rest of us thought would work, tried it anyway, it didn't work, and he ended up right at the back of the pack for the whole race. So what he did is he parked himself on a corner and abused one of the rules of the game that allows you to sit there, skip your turn, and just sit on the racetrack and not move. And the rules are that you can't overtake in a corner. Huh. So basically just put a kibosh on the entire game there until you got him out of the corner. Yeah. So what, what we ended up doing is speaking to him and saying, look, I, I'm not really happy that you are deliberately trying to just, you know, screw the game up, spoil the game for everybody else. The six of us at the gaming table, we're all here to play the game properly and we're all here to, you know, enjoy ourselves. And one player yeah. deliberately going out of the way to, you know, spoil that experience because he thinks it's fun w was not on. So we spoke to him and made it clear that if he wants to continue to do that, we will remove his car from the track and effectively eject him from the game, which was an uncomfortable discussion to have. I don't know whether I've ever had that before, and if I ever have, it was a long time ago. So it's a rare, a rare thing to happen. And thankfully, I had the backing of all of the other people at the table. Yeah. So, you know, if it was just me, it would have been even worse. Um, have you ever had anything like that happen? Luckily, with my group, no, we haven't. Um... I'm just now, our group basically meets, basically meets what, once a month for about four hours. Right. We're all, most of us are, are parents or older, older gentlemen. And so these four hours are basically our time to game together outside of our family units. So normally we treat each other <laughs> with, with, with good respect to who's on the table and we, we just play out the games. Yeah. It's, it, it kind of, I, I don't envy that position at all, but I think y'all handled it well. 
Yeah. So we finished off that night with another racing game, which was Automobiles from AEG, which is a sort of light to medium bag builder game using cubes. We didn't get to finish it, unfortunately, um, which was a shame because I think I was in the lead at the point we, we, we were packing up. But it's actually quite nice. I don't know if you've seen this one. I have seen it. It's uh, another one on my short list of games to pick up sooner or later right. or play. I like the idea of the racing game and it seems kind of euro-y too a little bit so yeah i mean it's got it's bag building and it's got elements of of, of dominion in a way because you're you're, yeah. you're bag building and there are uh four shades of gray which was a bit unusual for the gears <laughs> they're, they're always in every game and that's what you use to move okay. but then there are other colored cubes which do different things special abilities and there are like i think there's maybe four or five purple cards and you pick one of them and that's what the purple cubes do and then you pick one of the red cards, and that's what the red cards do. So you shuffle all of those cards at the start of the game and pick one for each colour. So in every game, you're using a different set of these power cards, effectively. Um, and yeah, it, it was quite cool. And as I say, it's 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 a good light to medium race game. So yeah. quite quite enjoyed yeah. that. Yeah, being a race game, it automatically has me interested. Um, right. My only issue was I, I wasn't a huge fan of trains. Right. So this one kind of wasn't an instantly, you know, as soon as I see it available, I don't go out and grab it. But it is yeah. one... I've heard really, really good things from the people who have played it, so it'll right. it'll it'll be here sooner or later. Cool, cool. Um, on the Friday, we got a full four-player game of Trickerion in. Now, one of the players hadn't played before, and we said to him, we said, look, this is a fairly heavy game, but if you're all right jumping in at the deep end, it's going to take us probably all night. We'll play the full game, and and we did. And it was about four hours, maybe four and a half hours. I say the full game. We didn't use the Magician's Powers, which is okay. like a, another add on extra because you know it, it's a heavy enough game as it was now this one miss, missed you by didn't it it did it's one of those games that i really i have a handful of games from like what last year that i didn't back on kickstarter that i really regret and this is right at the top of the list the theme itself yeah. seems a perfect fit for my wife um my only thought was you know that length of time to play it and things like that and so that's why it kind of got pushed off to the side in favor of other lighter weight games that I ended up picking up at Kickstarter at that time. Yeah, I mean, if you're playing two-player, it would be a lot. I, I've played the two-player full game, and I think it took us maybe a couple of hours. Okay, that's really not that bad. Yeah, it was only because it was four players and, and one guy was new, so we had to go through you know, all of the basic rules about, yeah. about how it works. But one interesting thing about the game is, as I said, we all liked it, and I think that might be my fourth game of it. it turns out I'd been playing a rule wrong, and it's quite a big rule, and it's a rule which has made me rethink the game because I really enjoyed teaching Trickerion because I think a lot of the rules are very easily thematically explained, which I think is great in a game and it helps me teach it and it helps learn it. And it turns out one of them I, I was getting wrong. And it's the rule about when you go to the theatre, if you go on a Thursday, you have more time to set up your tricks. Makes complete thematic sense, okay? If you go on a Sunday, you have less time to set up your tricks. But any tricks that are performed on a Thursday don't get as many bonuses. And I, re I explain that because your audiences on a Thursday are less. Yeah. But on a Sunday, your audiences are more. And therefore, every trick that's performed you know, gets more fame and more money because there's a bigger audience. And I loved that rule and was able to explain it thematically, and it was great. <laughs> However, got it wrong. Oh, no. Yeah, and they, the designers have said that the rule is in there for game balance and, it, um, and they've accepted that it kind of doesn't fit, but it is needed. And, and I actually agree with them. So what I was doing in my game when we played is I was going on the Thursday backstage setting up the tricks and it gave me extra time to do that. So I got loads more tricks on the board. Those tricks were being performed on the Sunday, but by somebody else, because you can do tricks in other people's performances which okay. works and is thematic. Yeah. So if, if you went on the Sunday, for example, and you chose to perform something and, I, and one of my trick markers was on there, even though I'd set it up on the Thursday, I would get the bonus because it's actually being performed on the Sunday. And that makes total thematic sense. And we thought that was one of the tricks of the game. You know, one of the, one of the gameplay things that you had to learn and get used to. But it is a bit too good. So the rules <laughs> actually are... If you perform that performance on a Sunday, but I have one worker on the board on a Thursday slot, then I get the penalties as if it was performed on a Thursday, which makes absolutely no thematic sense whatsoever, <laughs> but that's the rules. Yeah. 
And I feel terrible. I've got to now go back to all of the other people who I've taught to play and say, look, we got this rule wrong. And I don't think anybody's going to like this new rule, but <laughs> I'm going to have to play with it because that's... Otherwise, the game is a bit, you know, it doesn't work the way the design is intended. But yeah. yeah, it's a bit odd. You've you've given us all hope here, Paul, by by admitting that you've gotten a rule wrong this many times. All of us, <laughs> not, <laughs> people who don't do this for a living, live with this all the time. We've gotten a rule wrong. We got to go back to our groups and say we played this wrong. And I yeah, apologize. I don't know whether <laughs> I I learned it wrong initially, or I was taught it wrong, or I read it wrong. But since then, I never felt the need to go back to the rule book and reread that bit because I thought I'd got it right. You thought it made it, yeah. Thought it made complete sense. And and then I saw this. Yeah, I saw this thread on BGG and people were like, oh, is that, uh, is that right? And it's like, oh, okay. So yeah, need, need to undo that. Anyway, moving yeah. on, Saturday <laughs> was Time Stories Prophecy of Dragons. Now you've played, you've played Asylum, haven't you? I have, we have finished Asylum and yeah. we are one run into Marcy. Okay, so Prophecy of Dragons, this one's different. Okay. And it, it's probably more different than the others. <laughs> Some people prefer this one to the others. I personally thought this was the weakest of the three. It's not to say that we didn't have a great time playing it and it was really enjoyable, but it is different in the way that it works. And I'll try not to give any spoilers away. Potentially, okay. you could do this in one run. And I know one group on, or a couple of groups that have posted on BGG have done it in one run. Hmm. We did it in three took us about six and a half hours, which is a lot longer than the other two cases. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really enjoying Time Stories. I'm enjoying the experience of playing it uh, and getting people around. And, and you know, because it, it, it's such a different game from everything else. It I is. don't class it as, as a normal type of game, and I'm enjoying it. The biggest problem was the text on some of the cards. Now, there was some problems with the previous cases where there was some cards which were very ambiguous and people interpreted them in different ways. But in this one, there's a lot of ambiguity and unfortunately, there's a lot of mistakes on the cards as well. That's a shame. Yeah, anybody who is planning to play Prophecy of Dragons from Time Stories, go and check out the FAQ on BGG, which Space Cowboys have allowed me to rename the unofficial FAQ to be the official FAQ Very cool. because I've been working with them on it and I've tried to keep it spoiler free. So but basically I've said, look, when you get to location two, read this bit. Yeah. And because there's, there's some cards in location two where the text on the cards is wrong and therefore you'll play it wrong, which for some people it doesn't bother them, you know, because it's kind of, you know, it doesn't matter if you play it wrong, but for a lot of people it, it, it does matter, including yeah. me. We kept the uh, we kept your FAQ open pretty much the entire time through Asylum, and we were doing the same with Marcy, so it, it did help us out. After we, after we finished Time Stories, I got three games in of The Grizzled, which a friend of mine, Mark, had recently picked up, and I enjoyed The Grizzled, but I was a little bit underwhelmed, and that is because so many people have been saying how amazing this game was, and one of their best games of last year and everything else. And as I say, it was okay, and it had some nice stuff in there, and I'd play it again, but based on all the hype that it was getting, I was like, oh, okay. Is that it? Yeah. I could see this one coming out and, and hitting a lot of people that way, just because of, you know, the background of the of the game, who created it, and everything like that. Yeah. And it and it is thematic, or, or at least it, it gives off that pretense of being a really 30-minute thematic co-op. Yeah. That's hard. <laughs> yeah, it is It is hard. And, and theme-wise, I'm in the main mechanics of the game, I suppose the theme is there, but at the end of the day, it's an abstract game. You play a game, you play a card, you put it in the middle yeah. of the table. If there are then three matching symbols, you've failed the mission. That That's kind of abstracty. I mean, you know, but the, the bit which I really thought was thematic was the hard knocks cards, because okay. every one of them, when you get it, the name of the card and the, the effect it has on the game is absolutely thematically tied to the name of the card and and what they've said. Um, yeah. And they all fit with the, the the setting and the theme and everything else. So, yeah, you know, good job on them. They they were good. Yeah. I hope to get that one played pretty soon. It's on the uh, it's on the stack of games that I'd hope to maybe try today. We're going right. to try to get a a month of Pandemic Legacy or a game of that in and maybe we'll warm up with the grizzled, you know. Yeah. Nothing like beating ourselves up or over the head before we do some Pandemic. Yeah, I mean, we played three games and we lost every single one. And that was <laughs> that was on the easy setting where we didn't yeah. use these trap cards. And I've heard that the game doesn't scale perfectly, that three player is the easiest and fifth is, five okay. player is the hardest. So, 
yeah, we weren't very mm. good, but we will get better. So moving on, Tuesday I played another game of Inhabit the Earth, which is my third game of this. I taught three others how to play. One player, Jack, just got it straight away. He understood the rules, he understood the gameplay, the card combos, and yeah, he just put everybody else to shame and just, he was clearly gonna win from like a third of the way through the game, which isn't a problem for me. So he did win. Um, the other two players, I came second, the other two players were struggling because it is a game I think which takes at least one game to get the hang of how it, how it works and how it all hangs together. It's got relatively simple rules, but the gameplay, the decisions you have to make in your turn is, is quite tricky. So, yeah. yep, I, it's one that was there for a while, and I was going to pick up, and I was wanting to pick up, but I just never did. And so it's kind of, I've kind of forgotten about it. But you know, I, I've heard really good things about it, and I've never played a Richard Breeze game. Right. So, so maybe this instead of Keyflower. But who oh, knows? Well, no, I, I would. I mean, I like the game, but I also know that it's not for everyone. And yeah. I would say Keyflower is a much, much better game. Okay. I, I love Keyflower. So yeah. um, I, I would definitely try Keyflower, which works great from two to six. Good deal. Yep. Sooner or later, I'm going to try that. I, you know, I hear about all these. If, if I played every game or if I could get every game, I, it would be perfect, but I can't. Yeah. I know. I don't know why, but Richard Breeze is one. I love those nice Euros that I don't know why. I just never have picked up any of his. Yeah. Well, put key, Keyflower on the list for, to definitely try it. Will do. So, uh, and recently, the last thing is I played a whole bunch of two-player games. Um, Imperial Settlers, Tides of Time, Baseball Highlights, and an old abstract game called Kahuna, which I got in, like, 99. It's in the Cosmos two-player series of games, yeah. and I haven't played it in years. But, as I say, it was, it was Friday night, only one person came over, so we dug out a whole load of two-player games. And it is really good. It's just very simple. It's an abstract game, placing black and white bridges on the board to try and control islands. But yeah, if you like two-player games, which you do, do. I think, yeah, yeah we do. I would, I would keep an eye out for that one. I have no idea if you can get it anymore. As I yeah, said, my, it's, my it's, old. it's one on your list here that I immediately started looking up about and was going to see <laughs> about finding a copy of it. Um, around here, my oldest daughter used to be, we used to be a three-player group predominantly here at the house, right. but my oldest daughter is kind of hitting that age where she's doesn't want to hang around mom and dad oh, all the okay. time playing games. They're, so so it's become cool more anymore. of a two-player household until okay. until our six-year-old joins us. So Kahuna's definitely on the list. Yeah, if you want to try it out before you buy, it is available on yukata.de. Is it so Yukata? I'll, I'll, I'll okay. send you an invite for it. That'd be perfect. It, it is on there. Cool. I'd like to try it. Now, one game that you wanted to talk about, Fog of Love. Yeah, my wife and I were lucky enough to get a preview copy of Fog of Love, which just launched on Kickstarter this morning. Okay. which is the 14th of February. Uh, it's a two-player game. It's a card game where you're basically playing out the your romance from beginning from those first sparks of, you know, flirting and getting to know each other. And then as the game builds, the choices that you make in the card play and, and with everything become more intense. You, know, it, you could have almost anything. You could have like a an unplanned pregnancy, marriage proposals, all sorts of weird things can pop up into it. And it it's really, what's the word I want to, it's really different than what we normally sit down and play. Okay. And how do you win the game? Um, ultimately, for the game to win, there, there are three ways. One person can win, the other, or both people can win. Okay. Or nobody can win. All right. Ultimately, okay. ultimately, each player has a set of story ending cards. And those cards are generally, they're going to give you your win condition, basically. You have to have certain certain traits will have to be at certain place. You'll have to be really sensitive or you'll have to be, you know, a hardened kind of person, you know, and then you'll also have to find different points or love points is what they're called. So ultimately through the game, you're getting rid of these story cards. I think there's about seven or eight of them that you start with and you're getting rid of them as you go through the game. And so ultimately towards the end, when you get to that finale, you're going to have two story cards to choose from. And you better hope that you've played everything correctly. <laughs> okay. Or, or you're not going to win. He did send us, uh, Jacob Jaskov is the designer. He did send us a version that is a pure co-op. Right. And we have not played that one yet. We're hoping to maybe get a try of that in today or tomorrow. We have a nice four-day weekend here in the States. So I'm, we're off tomorrow. We're going to try to play some more of that. But it's a really interesting kind of almost role-playing storytelling kind of game. And my wife and I aren't role players by any right. means. And and this had us kind of acting out our parts, you know, 
I was, I forgot my name. I think it was Dick Francis. I was a politician <laughs> and, 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 it, and she was a bartender. So we were kind of acting out that whole thing through, through it. And it was a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun to play. Okay. Cause last year we had, um, and then we held hands. Yes, we did. Which was more of an abstract yeah. kind of, and, and ultimately, if I'm not mistaken in that one, you don't even talk to your partner, no. which I always no. found odd, but it could be kind of interesting too. But yeah, no, we played that. Um, and we've really enjoyed Fog of Love. And then we've played some House of Borgia, which is kind of a new It's a Kickstarter that's coming as well. So that's predominantly what my plays have been over the past week or so have been Kickstarter previews. Uh, House of Borgia is more if, you, if you've ever played Liar's Dice. Um, Love it. Yeah. It, this is kind of takes that Liar's Dice mechanic and throws a big theme on it. You're trying to get you're trying to manipulate some cardinals to have the one you want to be the next pope. Because the Pope's okay. dead. You're trying to manipulate that. You want to you wanna have your Pope be the one that gets elected. So it's kind of fun. You're using that liar's dice mechanic of bidding like three bribe, you know, and that yeah. goes around and everything like that. So okay. that one's been a lot of fun. Uh, we played some Wyatt Earp, uh, which is one of the mystery rummy games, if you're familiar. It's, yeah. I guess technically it's not a mystery rummy game. I guess they never called it that, but it feels like one, which yeah. we really enjoyed. And I don't think I'm ever going to play with my wife again okay. because she just she just. <laughs> slobber knocked me i <laughs> i couldn't do anything that's what we've been playing <laughs> yeah and that's what i've been playing and that's what you've been playing so yeah thanks very much for joining me in this section of the podcast and i'll i'll speak to you soon you got it paul thank you very much for having me Special guest. so joining me on the show this week is none other than vita lacerda who listeners to previous podcasts will have heard me talk about a lot before not only because i like his games but he's also one of my clients and i've done work on kanban the gallerist and vinyos so welcome to the show vital oh hello paul it's nice to talk with you again and thank you for the nice words and hello everybody now, I've got a few things that I wanted to ask you myself, but there's also been a, a great response over on my BGG Guild with lots of people with lots of other questions for you. I'm not going to have time to go over all of those questions because I try and keep the podcast short, but if you were able, after this podcast goes out, to maybe pop onto the Guild and answer some of the other questions, that would be really cool. Oh, sure. It will be my pleasure. I usually do, so no trouble at all. Excellent, excellent. So, the first thing to talk about is Vinyos Deluxe, which is on Kickstarter right now. It's currently raised uh, over $200,000. It's knocked through a lot of the stretch goals, and it seems to be doing quite well. Yeah, it's true. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, I was not aware that Vinyos had so many fans. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the support everybody is giving to the campaign and, of course, to me. And I can say that because of all of you, uh, now I can work in my designs almost at full time. Uh, I'm starting to live my dream right now. Thank you so much. Yeah. So my first question is about Vinyos. When did you decide that it was time to go back and do a new version of it? You know, have you been planning this for a few years or have you just decided recently? Yes. Well, I already had some work in the remake of Vinyos during the last few years. Uh, a lot of new ideas had grown with the, the comments I uh, 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 get almost every day from so many players. You can see that for the number of stretch goals I created for the Kickstart campaign. So, yeah. uh, Vinyos was also out of print for some time, and people keep asking me about a new reprint. Uh, after I got my rights back, and Eagle Games offered me that opportunity, and I could not refuse since uh, they give me total freedom to develop my project. So, uh, I've been uh, I, I work with them before. I did the gallery list, and as you know, I'm not only involved in the design, but I also do a lot of development, the rule book. I choose the entire team. Um, I also make the 3D drawing you see out there and in the rules. And I will always support my designs as much as I can. So I'm doing uh, a full-time uh, work on Venus for uh, a bit uh, of time already. Uh, yeah, a lot of people probably don't realize just how much you actually do on the game. You don't just design it and then pass it on to the publisher. You're fully involved all the way through. So so it was a combination of circumstances then, as you say, comments that had been given to you over the last few years about the original game of Vinyos, it going out of print, you getting the rights back, all of those things combined together and you went, right, 
time to do a new version. Right, um, and of course, I, I want to revisit my my all my designs since uh, the games are out there being play testing a lot. <laughs> so with so many players, so I, I, I listen and uh, I have ideas to that can improve the games. And let's see uh, if I can make a new uh, versions of my oldest games in the future too. Yeah. Because, uh, as you know, I, I keep playing my, my games, so uh, I, I, I really like to, to make them better. And I hope if I ever made a new reprint of some of them, and I'm doing with Vinyus, uh, I hope to make it better every time the reprint is made. Okay, so if anybody's interested in the new version of Vinyos, go and have a look at the Kickstarter campaign now. I've personally played the new version, and I'm not just saying this because you're you're on now, but I do like the new version better than the old one. The reason for that is I like heavy games, but the old version for me was perhaps just just a little bit too heavy, which meant my enjoyment of playing it was, was reduced somewhat because of a couple of extra complications. And the new version, all of that has been cleared up, so I can actually just, you know, enjoy the game without those extra bits that bothered me, which is really good. I, I hope uh, all the people think the same. <laughs> mm. But um, but this this new version does come with the old one as well. So if you did prefer the old one to the new one, you can still play that with this new version. No design is perfect, right? So you can always improve it. But uh, uh, many people still prefer to play the, the first version. And when I um, ask Eagle Games if they agreed with um, with this type of new release, they love the idea, so uh, I keep I kept the, the the first edition as it was, just with the new art from Yen. Excellent, excellent. So now on to some of the questions that we've had from the BGG Guild. A couple of people have asked when you're going to design a lighter family game because you're you're known for your fairly heavy games. Now I think you have designed a lighter family game that not everybody knows about. So tell us about Dragon Keepers. Yes, Dragon Keepers is the, the the biggest challenge <laughs> of my designing game until now, because as you know, I'm designing complex game and making making a simple one. Uh, it's not been uh, an easy uh, work to do, especially because I'm working with a girl, a little girl, mm -hmm. uh, my my youngest daughter, and uh, she have tastes that I don't. So, right. <laughs> uh, I'm still working in the design. It's not. It's not finished, but uh, it's been a challenge. It's. It's true. It's been a challenge. Okay. Because I would like to have a, a family game, a quick family game that plays in 15, 20 minutes. And the game is now. It was uh, once a competitive game. Now it's a cooperative one. But Dragon Keepers, it has an entry on Board Game Geek already. I think. Yes, it is. It has. Yeah. So if anybody wants to go and find out any information about that, even though, as you say, it is still in the design stage at, at this point. Yes, it is. And I hope to, to finish it at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Um, now, Jamie wants to know how good it feels to have such a great rules videos for your games. I don't, I, I'm not quite sure what he means by this. Is there a, is there a rules video <laughs> for your games somewhere? Yeah, I, I think there is one video about the rules, but uh, it, it was made by a company with a strange name, you know, something about gaming and rules. Yeah, never heard of them. Uh, strange thing, really. Uh, just search for it in YouTube, and I even heard it is a good one, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you heard. So go and find it. Okay, so moving on. Michael Logan, he always has good questions. Um, he's actually got three, but I'll just ask one of them here, and hopefully you can answer the other two on the Guild. Okay. And he wants to know, what comes first for you, mechanics or theme? Oh, I, I, I answer that question all the time. I, I, can't, I, I, I can't start any design uh, without having the team first. Yeah. And I do a lot of research, and uh, it, it's one of the parts that I most love in the making or creating new games, is to research about the team. And all my games start with the team. And the next one, also because I cannot start a game without having the team first. Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. So that's, that's that question. The answer. team is the first one. <laughs> I ask, yes. I look for you. Um, Nafmi wants to know, which one of your games would you suggest as the starting point for somebody who hasn't played any of your games yet? Oh, what about Dragon Keepers? <laughs> Apart from Dragon If somebody wants to play a, a Vita Lacerda heavy game, oh, which one should they try first? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it all depends on the team that people ask uh, things that... Uh, 
it better suits him. Uh, the new version of Vinhos, it's easy to understand, uh, difficult to play, as you know. The um, uh, CO2, it's a cool different team and um, doesn't have that many rules, so you can start by it. And uh, as people saying, my lightest game or less heavier game is the gallerist, so go for it. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it depends on the theme. Yeah, it depends on the team. So speaking of themes, which ones uh, don't you like? Is there a theme that you would never use in a game? Yeah, there is. Zombies. <laughs> okay. I will never design a game about zombies. And this is why I like you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't understand. Uh, they are dead people, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. But it's very popular and games with zombies do sell very well. Yeah, I know, I know, I know that. And uh, Americans, especially Americans, like them a lot, but I cannot understand the, the hype. Okay. And does that stretch out to other forms of horror as well, or just, just zombies? No, no, I like, I like. I, I'm a fan of terror, game, of terror movies. Okay. Uh, horror movies. Uh, I'm a fan of um, uh, Love, uh, Love... Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft. Yeah. So uh, I like horror movies. Uh, it's just zombies because <laughs> I'm afraid of... Uh, maybe I'm afraid of dead people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's it. That's, fair, yeah. if that's a good answer. Um, the, uh, Chris from the Games Hunter wants to know of the innovations that you've introduced into your games, which one of them are you most proud of? Oh, let me see. I, I try to have at least a new mechanics or try to innovate something in each of my games. At least once. It's, it's not uh, easy. But uh, let me see. In Vinus, I love the Quadro, right? Yeah. And I think I will use this uh, in another game. Uh, CO2... The cooperative way of reach the summits, where you uh, go with other players to complete the summits, that's one of our part of the game that I think that is innovative and uh, quite good. And can burn probably Sandra, right? Okay, yep. And in the galleries, uh, uh, probably the kick-out uh, mechanics. Uh, okay. And now in Lisbon, I think I have a couple right. of them too. So. so you've got one for each of the games that you've designed then? Yeah, at least one, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to think that I have something new in each game. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of Sandra, Justin asks, have you ever had a boss named Sandra? Yes, I have. Every day I, 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 have with the, uh, I, I live with her. Yes. So. <laughs> it's my wife. <laughs> Sandra, it's really my wife. Yes. So, so the follow-up question of is she mean or nice, we won't ask that one. Yeah, she has these days, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, so that's about all we've got time for from the questions from other people. There's one extra one that I was going to ask you about. Now, it's about semi-co-op. I personally believe that semi-cooperative games are fundamentally flawed and just don't work at all. I, I've got a real downer on semi-cooperative games. But all of your... Let's put CO2 aside for one now, for, for a moment. All of your other games, there is a semi-cooperative element in them. Yes, yeah. So in, in Vinyos... Two people can end up with estates from the same region, right. which means they're both placing renown cubes and can both benefit from those renown cubes. In the gallerist, you can have two people with the same, with a piece of art from the same artist, and it's in their joint interests to improve them both. Um, and in Kanban as well, you, you do get not directly semi-cooperative work, but there is definitely an element of, I'll do this and it helps you a bit. But hopefully, yes, then you'll do a bit which helps me. Line to making the, the producing the yeah. cars, yeah, yeah. And you, in CO two, don't uh, talking about the game itself, but you also have mechanics when we go to other players to the same summit to complete it. So yes, it's another element of cooperate. I, I like to add that those elements because I think it's a good way of uh, cooperative play, right? Of yeah. uh, the interactivity between uh, people. Uh, during uh, play. There is a lot of complaints that uh, many games are solitary, uh, many yeah. heroes, and that is one way I see to interactive, uh, to, to, to increase the interactivity between uh, players. Yeah, yeah. but that, that seems to be in all of your games as a standard, and I, I think it's a good thing, because as you say, it adds this other level to it, and because I think that semi-cooperative as a game doesn't work, but having a semi-cooperative element within a game does work and it provides a really interesting sort of extra twist to things yes i agree with you and i also have it in, in the new game lisboa as you know yeah. yeah 
Yes. So, so, so before you go, let's just talk a little bit about Lisboa because a lot of people want to know. You know, Vinyos is pretty much done and dusted. You've designed that, and it's you know it's going through. But the next big game is Lisboa. Uh, yes, uh, it's. I, I've been playtesting Lisboa for a long time, as you know, and uh, I'm playtesting like crazy right now. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Lisboa is a game about rebuilding my city, the city where I live, uh, Lisboa. Uh, after a big earthquake that happens in 7055, that kill and destroy uh, almost the city. Um, the game is a card management game. You, so you play cards in your tableau and you send cards to, to the middle of the board to, to take the actions. And what you will do is to rebuild the city and you will help the three major characters of that time and to get the most wigs. Because wigs uh, were very important in the 18th century. <laughs> People, right. the, the bigger wig, more important you were. So <laughs> the, okay. it's the, the, the system of points. Wigs is the victory points. Yeah, it's the victory points. What I like a lot is how players can manipulate the economy in the game and the scoring system. Those are, I think, the best um, innovative uh, parts of this game. Okay. Um, Ian will be the artist of the game. Yep. And uh, I, I play testing in Tabletopia with a lot of people. It is a thing that is new to me. And I'm enjoying it a lot because I can try new mechanics all the time. Yeah. So this is the game is still in development at the moment, although you are planning to release it later on this year. Yeah, I hope it will be ready to Essen. Yeah. So uh, excellent. So that's Lisboa. For, uh, if anybody's wondering what to expect, it's going to be of a similar weight and complexity to your other games but again a very different theme yes it will be it will be it's a medium heavy game and uh, um, you are expecting to have difficult decisions everything is interconnected with each other with uh, all the elements are interconnected and if you like to play test it in tabletop you just look for the forum in the game page and i'm scheduling uh, play testings online if yeah. you want to join I appreciate Excellent. it. So uh, that's about it for all the questions. Thanks again for coming on the show, and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you for inviting me, Paul. I always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye bye. Gaming rules news. The main thing that I've been working on recently is the video for Zolkin from CGE. Now, I'm planning to do this all digital, and so it's required me to have to learn a whole set of new 3D skills to be able to get the gears moving together with the workers on them. And I've never done anything like that before. I've still got a lot of work to do on this video, so it won't be ready anytime soon. I've also been helping write rules and do a bit of development for a game called Edge of Humanity that's an interesting take on deck builders and does it in a very different way. Um, I can't say too much more about that at this stage, but hopefully more later on in the year. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about in this section, and I'm going to post this to my BGG guild too. So if you want to contribute, then please post to the guild. It's about the new interface for Board Game Geek. Now, Board Game Geek is probably the most valuable site any board gamer has got. It's helped me get into the hobby, and it's been around for a long time and is just an absolute valuable source of information. Everybody listening to this podcast probably already knows about Board Game Geek. And they also know that the interface is very, very dated. Well, finally, the new interface is in beta. It's an open beta now, so there's a lot of work gone into it. Now, there's one thing that I want to mention about the new interface, and it's something which I feel quite strongly about, and I have a personal and professional interest in it. And that is the default sorting order for videos seems to now have defaulted to hottest rather than most recent. Now, what this means as a consumer is that every time you go to look up a page on Board Game Geek, the hottest videos always appear at the top. So that's, that's good, right? Yeah, you always want to see whatever the most popular videos are at the top. Well, yeah, in a way, but if we put my other hat on for a minute, which is a person who actually creates media content and posts it on Board Game Geek, our stuff's always going to go to the bottom because we're not big, we don't have as many subscribers, we don't get as many thumbs and likes as, as the people who've been doing it for a while and are big, and that means anything we post, no matter how recent it is or how good it is, straight to the bottom of the list. Now, what that means is people are going to have to click on 
recent to change the sorting order, which let's face it, most people are not going to do. They're going to go to the page, they're going to see these top four videos or whatever, and that's all they're going to click on, which means the most popular videos, the ones that have already got the most thumbs, are, all, are just going to get more because they're going to get more audience. And the other people who don't have many thumbs, who are already at the bottom of the list, they're going to have to, we're all going to struggle to actually get more views. Now, we get a lot of views through Board Game Geek. It's one of the places where people go. They look up a game and they go, oh, somebody's done a video about that. I'll go and watch it. And unfortunately, for the, for the small time people who are creating videos, like myself, our videos are never going to appear in that list, which means nobody's going to see our videos from Board Game Geek and it's just going to hurt the smaller people. Anyway, as I say, I feel quite strongly about this, even though I can see both points of view. If you want to provide feedback to BGG and if you think the same thing and you want to provide feedback, the only way to do it is to go onto Board Game Geek, scroll to the bottom, bottom right there should be a feedback button and please let them know. Obviously, if you've got any other comments about the interface, then that's great. But if you agree that the default sorting order should be most recent in order to give a little bit of boost to the, to the people who don't have many subscribers and whose videos will otherwise just go unknown, then, then please do that. Anyway, I've gone on enough about it, but that, that's pretty much what I think. And now on to something a little bit more lighter, and that is the competition winners from last time. So I, I ran two competitions last time. The first was to win uh, a copy of the app for Baseball Highlight 2045, and I've drawn a name out of the hat, i.e. used my Excel spreadsheet random number generator, and the winner of that is Lance Coffey. So congratulations, Lance. I'll be contacting you on email, uh, probably have by the time you've listened to this, and I'll get you the code sorted out. The second competition was for a copy of Ignacy Trevishek's second book, Board Games That Tell Stories 2. And the winner of this competition is Craig Reck. So thanks very much for everybody who entered the competitions last time. And that's everything for Podcast 29. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. They're starting to run a little longer than they did originally, but nobody seems to have a big problem with that. Thanks again to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, and to Jason Short at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Take care, and thanks for listening.